All right, so this week, uh, as I said, we're going to take a look at two sections, 3-1 uh, and 4-1, splitting them both into a couple days. Um, the first section focuses on inverse trig. So last week, a couple people asked me when we had to do some flipping, like when we had to do one over the sign to get the cosecant and, and stuff like that. Some people noticed this button, this sign to the negative one, and said, is that the same thing? Can I, can I just do that instead of flipping it? Um, and my answer was no. This sign to the negative one is something different, and that's what we're going to learn um, right now. So what an inverse trig function is used for is to undo. It's kind of the opposite of a regular trig function. Okay, anytime we, we do something in math, there's always a way to reverse it. For example, if I take a number and square it, I can reverse that by, what's, what's the opposite of squaring? Yep. Square, root. square root. So those two operations undo each other. If I add, I can subtract. If I multiply, I can divide. In calculus, you can differentiate, and you can reverse that by integrating. Okay, they just undo each other. Okay, so as a numerical example, let's take the sine of 30. Okay, just see what we get. And I'm going to do it in degrees. You get 0.5. If I do the inverse sine of 0.5 and I hit enter, what answer do you think I'm going to get back? I'm going to get 30 back. So the sine of 30 is a half. The inverse sine of a half is 30. They just undo each other. Put you right back where you started. So usually we're not going to write out the word inverse sine. There's two abbreviations for it. One is more common than the other. Inverse sine is usually written as a sine to the negative 1. Or another way to write it is arc sine. It means exactly the same thing. Generally, if you look at an older book or something with like older material, you might see arc sine. It means exactly the same as sine to the negative 1. What's a little confusing about this sine to the negative 1 is that negative 1 is up higher. Um, when we put a number up higher, it's usually a what? When you put a number up higher, it usually means it's an exponent. And if you did something like this or something like this, those are definitely exponents. That means sine squared. The one below it means sine cubed. When you do this, that negative 1 is not an exponent. It's just a symbol that means inverse sign. Okay? It's the only number that you can put in that spot that is not an exponent. So it's kind of weird. Um, so if th there's no way to, to put, um, you can't put a negative 1 there and have it mean an exponent. If you put a negative 1, it means inverse sign. Any other number, yes, it is an exponent. And we can use the same kind of notation for inverse cosine and inverse tangent. Inverse cosine is cosine with a negative 1, or arc cosine. And then inverse tangent is tangent with a negative 1, or arc tangent. So if you look uh, at that chart I just gave you, you might notice in the sine column, you see root 2 over 2 next to 45 degrees, and you also see it again next to 135 degrees. Well, that's a problem. That means there's two answers if you're using root 2 over 2 and, and sine. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you which answer to always pick. The calculator would only give you one answer. We only want to get one answer from the chart. So when you're dealing with inverse sine, and you have a choice about which angle to give me, I would always like the one between negative 90 and positive 90. And there will only be one. Okay, there's only one choice between those two numbers. If you're dealing in radians, it's negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. When you're dealing with inverse cosine, 
Okay, again, if you look down the cosine column, you will find the same number written more than once. And in that case, I want you to give me the answer between 0 degrees and 180 degrees. That's exactly how a calculator would do it. That's exactly how we're going to use this chart to do it. If you're dealing in radians, it's between 0 and pi. And now, um, the last one, inverse tangent. If I ask you a question about inverse tangent, you should always give me the answer that's between negative 90 degrees and positive 90 degrees. Now, if you look carefully, is what you're supposed to be between for inverse tangent and inverse sine, are they the same? Is that about Alan? Are they the same? Sure. Okay, how come? I have no idea. You're not sure. So look, uh, not on the chart, up on the board. If you look at what are the numbers for inverse sine and inverse tangent, I told you you have to be between certain numbers, and these are these are the numbers you've got to be between. Are the numbers you have to be between for inverse sine and inverse tangent the same? Yes. Yes. All right. What do you have to be between for inverse sine? It's not down there. Between negative ninety and ninety. Between negative ninety and ninety, and can you include negative ninety and ninety? Yes. Yes, you can. What are the numbers you have to be between for inverse tangent? Same thing. Same numbers. Can you include negative 90 and 90? No. No. How come? How do you know that? I don't know. I just took a wild guess. You just took a wild guess. <laughs> Can anybody tell me why he's, his wild guess is right? Yeah. Because it's not less than or equal to. So it's, it's less than or equal to. There's no equal to. Look at the inequality symbol. That has an equal to on the inverse side. On the inverse tangent, it doesn't. And the reason is, if you look at your chart, let see if I have a page with a chart on it. If you look at tangent, go down to 90, look what happens. It says undefined. That's why I did not put it equal to when we're dealing with the tangent. It cannot equal 90. It also can't equal um, negative 90. If you're like, well, wait, isn't that 270? Yeah, 270 is the same as negative 90. Remember, you can add or subtract 360. That's how you get the negatives. Okay, just adding and subtracting 360. Okay, so that's that's the difference between the inverse sine and inverse tangent. Okay, so just be careful with that. Any questions on those numbers? Now, the first one we're going to take a little bit closer look at. We're going to say, well, why negative 90 to 90? Okay. Why not why not zero to 180 for the first one? Why why do we use that in the second one? Well, I'm going to show you why we use negative 90 to 90 in the first one. So what I've done is I made a, made a chart, and I've put these four angles on it, and I'm going to take the sine of each one of them. Okay? So let's just go through and, and see what we get. Um, the first one we already did. Sine of 30 was 1 half. Okay. Sine of 65. We get 0 0.906, and the sine of 90, we get 1. And the first one we, we did, the sine of 30 is a half. The inverse sine of a half is 30. It takes you back. Um, how about Jordan? What if I did the inverse sine of 1? What would I get back? So the sine of 90 gives me 1, the inverse sine oh, of 1 gives me 90. Gives me 90, takes me back. Okay, so there's really no issue. Right? Well, let's do the sine of 150 and watch what happens. You get a half. Why is that a problem? It's the same as 30. So now if I said to you, what is the inverse sine of a half? and you didn't know this right here. 
you'd say, well, there's two numbers I could go back to. I could either say 150 or I could say 30. So we know the correct answer is 30 okay, for, for what we're doing because you always pick the one between negative 90 and 90. 150 is not between negative 90 and 90. Okay, but why negative 90 and 90? Well, it has to do with something we're going to look at in a lot more detail next week, which is the picture of sine. Okay, so sine is a picture that looks like a wave. Okay. And the idea is, if you take a horizontal line, you draw it, you put it right there. How many times, if I kept draw, if I made that wave longer and I made the line longer, how many times would the wave and the straight line keep crossing? Again, assume I just extended out that wave, just kept drawing it, and, and kept drawing the line as long as I wanted to be. Indefinitely. Yeah, they would cross infinitely many times. Well, that's a problem. Because everywhere they cross, that's an answer on the chart where two things um, are the same. Okay. If I put this line right there, tried to put it exactly at 0.5. Okay. This is 0. This is 1. Okay. I put it right at 0.5. It crosses 0.5 right there. That's 30 degrees. If you go down a little further, that's 150. That's 180. 180 is half is halfway along that section I just drew in red. Okay. So we're going to get another answer again later on here and here. So we're going to keep getting these answers. And you could also go back in the other direction, get answers there and there. So we got to narrow it down. So when we look at the graph, that horizontal line would only hit at one time. So the way we do that is we kind of block the graph out. We block parts we don't want to see, and we say we're going to focus on a small section. Okay, let's try focusing on this section. That's the section from 0 to 180. How many times does my horizontal line hit the graph in that section? Oh, Justin. <coughs> Twice. Twice. That section's no good. We have to find a section that it would only hit once. So let's bring this over about like that. Let's bring that over about like that. Okay, and I'll erase this just so it looks a little cleaner. How many times, um, how about Colby, how many times does my horizontal line hit the graph in blue in that section? Once. And if I move it down, how many times now? Once. Once. No matter where I put it in that section, it only hits once. That's perfect. It only hits once, we only get one answer. Okay. That's negative 90 to positive 90. That's why we focus on the negative 90 to 90. Because when you look at the picture, it causes you to just get one answer. Questions on that? Um, Joe Michael, do you think that's the only section where I could kind of move these these blocks around and make it so it only hits one time? No, it's sure, but I'm going to say no. No, you're, you're right. There are other sections. For example, I could do something like that. Now, if I can move my horizontal line up and down, it still only hits once. So would that be another section that's okay to look at? Technically, but kind of the, the pattern, the, the convention that people follow is negative 90 to 90. That's exactly how a calculator does it. That's exactly how we'll do it. Okay. So we're going to stick with the negative 90 to 90. Um, this is the graph of cosine. Now, with cosine, we didn't do negative 90 to 90. Yeah. So when you type that into a calculator, it's going to give you the right answer from negative 90 to 90? That's or? how the calculator will do it. Okay. Yep. Uh, now, let's look at cosine. Does anybody remember, what were the two numbers I said you had to be between for, for cosine? Yeah, um, Austin? 
zero and 180. Zero to 180. Well, let's try negative 90 to 90 and see why that doesn't work. There's negative 90. It's that mark right there. Positive 90 is that mark right there. Hopefully you can see now if you draw a horizontal line, it would hit twice. That means in that section there could be two answers. We only want one. So now if we just slide it to zero, slide that right to 180, now we're, we're perfect. If we just focus on that section, you're guaranteed to only get one answer. And tangent is kind of the same idea. But that's, that's the reason why we have the numbers we do. All right, so this is just giving you a little perspective from what we did last week and what we're doing this week, just comparing the two things. So this is exactly the opposite of what we did last week. Last week, I would have given you a question like this. I would have given you the angle, 30 degrees. I would have given you a trig function like sine, cosine, tangent, secant, cosecant, or cotangent. And I would have said, what is the trig function of the angle I gave you? What is the sine of 30 in this case? This week, it's, kind of, it's the opposite. You would get a question like this. I'll give you the answer to the, to the question. I'll say the answer is 0 0.5. You have to tell me the sign of what angle would be 0 0.5, and it would be 30. Right, so last week, I gave you the angle. You gave me the answer. This week, I give you the answer. You give me the angle. Okay, and that's where this chart will come in. Okay, this, this will help us to do some angles. Obviously, this piece of paper is not a calculator. Okay, I can't put every single angle that exists on here, but there is a pattern to the ones that I, that I did put. That's the same chart you guys have. Did anybody notice a pattern to all the angles that, that you see? But well, um, Sam? Do you notice a pattern? Which angles are on there? Um, all the ones that were on that circle last week. And what were those? Can you describe them? No. Yeah, they're all multiples of 30 and 45. Yep, they're all multiples of 30 and 45. Obviously, 90 is a multiple of both. There's some overlap there. But every number you see in this list is a multiple of 30 or 45. So what do you do if it's not a multiple of 30, 45? Well, you don't use this chart. You gotta use the calculator instead. And I'll show you how to type stuff in on the calculator um, at the very end. So this is summarizing what, um, what we just said. If the trig function is an answer that is a multiple of 30 or 45, you're going to find it in the table. But that's kind of tricky. That's like saying how you need to know the answer before you solve the problem. How do you know if the answer is going to be a multiple of 30 or 45 before you solve it? Well, you have to look at the argument. You have to look at what they're giving you in the question. If you see the kind of numbers that we used last week, like square roots of twos, square roots of threes, zeros, ones, one halves, or anything I just said with a negative, you are gonna find that kind of number in this chart. All of the numbers in this chart are zeros, ones, one halves, square root of twos, square root of threes, or negatives of what I just said. So if you find it, if you're looking for the answer to a number that's like point inverse sine of 0 0.7, you can look on this chart, but there's no 0.7s in this chart. Okay. You're going to have to use a calculator. All right, so you look at what's in the parentheses. One, negative one, 
one half, okay. anything that's like numbers in that list. And then that's how you know the answer is going to be in the table. Okay. If it doesn't look like a number in that list, you're not going to find it in the table. Okay, so what we'll do next, we'll just practice um, evaluating some inverse trig functions. I'm going to give you a problem, I'm going to use the table, and try to find the answer. Okay, so let's start with the inverse sine of 1. So we've got to keep in mind what we're supposed to be between, negative 90 to 90. So if we do find an answer twice on here, we'll write them both down, but then we'll cross out the one that we're not using. Sometimes you're going to find two answers, sometimes you're not. Okay. So go to the sign column, find the number one, and go down until you find the angle that's in that row. So Tanner, if I go down the sign column, what what angle, what row do you find one in? You find it in 90 degrees, yep. And then if I keep looking, look on the back, uh, you might see a negative one, but you're not going to find another answer. So for this problem, there's only one answer. You don't have to worry about the second one. We just write it down. It's 90 degrees. Now, um, Tanner, if I asked for that in radians, what's um, 90 degrees in radians? It's pi over 2. So you can just look it right up on the chart, or if you remember how you convert by hand, multiply by pi, divide by 180. 90 goes into itself once. 90 goes into 180 twice. Pi over 2. Any questions on that one? Okay, let's try this one. Inverse sine of negative 1. So make sure you're in the right column. Okay, for sine. Go down until you find a negative 1. And if you have a choice, like a positive, you could read a positive or you could read a negative. Remember what you're supposed to be between, and that will tell you which one to write down. Right, so Emma, for um, sign, did you find a negative one? Yeah. Okay, and what row did you find it in? What was the angle in that row? Um, 270. 270? And what's that the same as? In degrees. Negative 90. So out of the two things you said, I should only write one of them. Does anybody know which one I should write down? 270 or negative 90? Jordan? Negative 90. Negative 90. Why did you pick that? Why not 270? Because that's to be between uh, 90 and... Yeah, between negative 90 and 90. Right. You've got to be between negative 90 and 90. 270 is not. So what I might do on a question like that is, I might ask you for the second answer. I'll say, give me both, and then tell me which one is the one that we should go with, which, which one is the correct one for our purpose. Because okay. the calculator will not give you the second answer. It will only give you negative 90. Okay. So the chart helps you get the second one. Questions on that? Let's try this one. Inverse sine of one half. All right, so Brady, um, where do you, what row do you see um, one half in? Thirty and one fifty. Yep, you're going to see it in thirty, which is the same as negative three thirty. But I'm not going to write negative 330 down because that's not between negative 90 and 90. Um, and then you said 150. Is that between negative 90 and 90? No. 
Well, the other way you can write 150 is negative 210. Is that between negative 90 and 90? No. So as I told you, if you do this right, you're only going to get one answer. None of the other answers will work. Okay. Any questions on how we got 30 and why negative 330, 150, or negative 210 doesn't work? Um, in radians, it would be pi over 6. Okay, if you're wondering what's going to be on the test, it's going to be a mixture of both. Okay, some problems will be degrees, some problems will be radians. Okay, so take, uh, take a minute on your own, see if you can find the answers to those. And make sure you find the ones that don't work. Okay, and circle the one that does. So let's take a look at um, inverse sine root 2 over 2. Um, Caitlin, do you think you, you found what the inverse sine of root 2 over 2 is? 45 degrees. Yep, 45 degrees. And the other answer, if I go down a little further, was 135. That's not between negative 90 and 90, so we don't use it. Inverse sine root 2 over 2. Um, about Ethan? Um, inverse sine of negative root 3 over 2. Uh, 30. How much? 30. 30? Um, let's see. So in the, if I go to the sine column and I go to the row that has 30, I see 1 half in that row. Oh, um, 60. 60. Okay. So we're a little closer, but in that row, it's a positive root 3 over 2, and we're looking for negative root 3 over 2. Anyone else help him out? Negative, what'd you say to Michael? Negative 60. Negative 60, perfect. Now, to Michael, on negative 60, you could have read 300. Why didn't you say 300? It's not It's not between negative 90 and 90, so he gave me the negative, which is the correct answer, negative 60. Okay. Or if you're doing it in radians, um, negative pi over 3. Okay. So any question on how to use this chart for inverse sign? Okay, just be careful, if it, if it has a negative, um, that usually makes a difference. What's kind of weird is that it would make a difference with inverse sign. Um, but if you look at inverse cosine, let's just look at one. Let's look at the cosine of 45 is root 2 over 2. Let's look at the cosine of negative 45. It's also root 2 over 2. So it turns out that if you take the cosine of a negative angle, the negative doesn't make a difference. You can look at the cosine of 120. Look at the cosine of negative 120. It's going to be the same thing on this chart. Okay. But in general, just be careful if it, if it does have a negative. Okay, so let's try, let's try this one. Okay. Inverse cosine of zero. Okay. Now, the first thing we want to do is kind of change, change our mindset a little bit. What are the two numbers we have to be between now? We're not negative 90 to 90 anymore. It's 0 to 180. Yeah. 0 to 180. And Luke, do you think you um, have the answer for inverse cosine of 0? 90 degrees. Yes, 90 degrees. So Luke, if the inverse cosine of 0 is 90, if I took the regular cosine of 90, what would I get? Zero. I would get 0. Okay. Kind of getting the idea that it just goes back and forth. Okay. Let's try inverse cosine of negative 1 half. Okay. Again, this has a negative, so make sure we look for that. Okay. 
question. Jill, did you find the row where uh, the cosine column has a negative 1 half in it? 120. 120. I thought we had to be between negative 90 and 90. So it's 0 to 180. It's 0 to 180, right, for cosine. So it's 120 degrees, or in radians, um, 2 pi over 3. Being able to convert degrees to radians in your head for angles that are multiples of 30 and 45 is pretty handy and trick. Okay. That's, that's how I'm doing them when I, when I show you. Okay. Because what I, all I really remember in my head to do it is these few facts. If I can remember those, everything is a multiple of one of those. It's like 120, all right? In my head, I think, okay, 120 is 60 doubled. So just take the answer for 60 and put a 2 in front of it, 2 pi over 3. That's how I convert 120 degrees in my head. Um, if you gave me 150, I would say, all right, 30 times 5 is 150. So just take the answer for 30 and stick a 5 in front of it. 5 pi over 6 is 150. Okay. But if I just remember those three facts, I can convert anything from degrees to radians in that table extremely fast and not have to worry about um, kind of doing any arithmetic. So last one for inverse cosine. Negative root 2 over 2. So inverse cosine of negative root 2 over 2. It's a good idea to make sure you can find the second answer, but if you're in the right column and you're looking at the right thing, the second answer, only one answer is going to work. Um, so how about uh, Nathan? Do you think you found um, inverse cosine for negative root 2 over 2? 225 degrees. How much? 225. 225. Um, what do we have to be between again? Oh yeah, 180. Zero to 180. So I agree with him that 225 is the other answer. So, so that's good. 135. But we're going to go with the 135 because it's between 0 and 180. In my head, if I'm converting that to radians, I know 45 times 3 is 135. So just stick a 3. It's 3 pi over 4. questions on them? All right, so we, we did a lot with inverse sine and inverse cosine. Um, I've only got two problems with inverse tangent. And then we'll go to the calculator and um, that'll be it. Okay, so see if you can um, do those two. Inverse tangent of square root 3, inverse tangent of negative root 3 over 3. And also in your head, remember what you have to be between. Okay, it's not 0 to 180 anymore. Right. Okay, let's take a look at the uh, first one. So inverse tangent of root 3. Um, Liz, can you remind me first, for inverse tangent, what are we supposed to be between? Um, negative 90 and 90. Negative 90 to 90. And how is that different from inverse sine? There's one thing, Alan, what's different between um, the negative 90 to 90 in inverse sine and the negative 90 to 90 for inverse tangent? It can't be negative 90 or 90. It has to be below or above. Stri yes, exactly. It's strictly between on inverse tangent. So it's like 89.999 and negative 89.99999. Okay, so it won't actually equal 90 or negative 90. Right. Um, how about... Um, Marisha, what'd you get for inverse tangent square root 3? Square root 3? Um, yep, yeah, the first one, square root 3. Uh, 
degrees. 60 degrees, yep. Which is pi over 3. Okay, the other answer, if you found it, um, just go down to the back, was 240. But that's not between negative 90 and 90. Express 240 as a negative, that's negative 120. That's also not between negative 90 and 90. Okay. Um, Pacey, how about the last one? Inverse tangent, negative root 3 over 3. Negative 30? Yeah, negative 30. So he had four choices, two positive, two negative, and he gave me the one answer that was correct. Any questions on those two? Okay, so again, this works great as long as your angle is a multiple of 35, uh, 30 or 45. But if the answer is not in the table, then we're going to use calculator. Okay. So if I looked at that problem, how would you know quickly looking at that problem that you're not going to find it in the table? Yeah? Does it look nothing like what we were dealing with last week? Yeah, these 0.65, that, that looks nothing like any of these numbers here. Okay, we've already talked about the kind of numbers you see in this table. 0.65 is not one of them. Okay, so the way you type it in, um, on a graphing calculator and on the calculators I let you guys use, you press second. Okay, so you've got to press the second button and then inverse sign. And then from there, just type it in. So it should look exactly like that. Doesn't really matter if you close the parenthesis unless you have more stuff you're going to type after. So I I closed it and I got forty point five four. And that was degrees. How do I know I did it in degrees? My calculator says right there at the top it's in degrees. If you wanted the answer in radians, you have two choices. Convert that to radians by hand. 40.54, um, that's not a one that I have memorized. That, that's kind of a random number to know, so what I would do to convert it to radians, change the mode on my calculator, and do it again. That's easier than converting it by hand, and I'm less likely to make a mistake. So 0.71 radians. Any questions on, on that? All right, so now if this was a multiple choice question, um, and I put these as choices, let's put um, 0 0.71 degrees, um, 40.54 degrees, 0.65 and I don't know apple. Out of those four choices, uh, which one is correct? It's not apple. Yeah. B. B. Okay, I agree with you. Why not A? Because A is not in radians. A is not in radians. The answer to that is 0.71 radians, not 0.71 degrees. So the way I have the choices listed there, B is correct. What if I did that? Which choice is correct now? Yep. A. Now A is correct. So on the test, you have to pay attention when you, if there will be some multiple choice questions, you have to look at the answers. If the answers don't have the little degree symbol, then you know they're in radians. If they do have the degree symbol, then put your calculator in degrees. Okay. But you will see that exact type of situation on the, on the test, just, just like that. Okay. Let's try um, inverse cosine negative 0.24. Second, inverse cosine negative 0.24. If you're doing it in radians, you should have gotten 1.8, about 1.81. If you're doing it in degrees, 
Okay, on my calculator, I have a button I can just bring up the last calculation so I don't have to type it all in again. You, you probably have that as well. It's 103.87. Any question on typing that? If you're getting those, you're doing it right. If you're not, then you're not doing it right. Okay. Let's try inverse tangent. And notice, you didn't even really have to think about it, but for inverse cosine, you're supposed to get an answer between 0 and 180. You did. For inverse psi, you're supposed to get an answer between negative 90 and 90. You did. The calculator will automatically give you the correct answer. Okay, anybody get um, the inverse tangent of 34.3? Uh, Jordan, did you get that one? You didn't get it? How about um, Luke? You have it? In degrees? Yeah, let's do it in degrees. 88.33. 88.33. And just because I know a little bit about what the graph of tangent looks like, I didn't show that one to you, I, can, I know that what he gave me seems pretty, pretty reasonable. I know that as this number gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the answer is going to get closer and closer and closer to 90. So like if you did the inverse tangent of 500, it's not going to be that much bigger than 88. It's going to probably be 89. Okay, it went up a little bit, 89.9. .9. If you did the inverse tangent of 5 million, it's almost going to be the same thing. It's going to be 89.99999, something like that. It will never reach 90. So. That's kind of a connection between what we did earlier and what I just explained. It can never equal 90, no matter how big of a number you put in. Eventually, the calculator might run out of decimal places. And once it uses up all the decimal places, then it's just going to say 90. But it's really 89.99999. Okay. Any questions on that? All right, so the last thing is still inverse trig, but it's these three, inverse secant, inverse cosecant, and inverse cotangent. Do we have a button on the calculator that has any of those things written out on it? So, Alan, do you see one? No. No. There is no button for inverse secant, inverse cosecant, or inverse cotangent. But what did we do last week to get the secant, the cosecant, and the cotangent? We took the sine, the cosine, and the tangent, and did what to them? We flipped them. Okay? We flipped the whole thing. Well, this is going to involve flipping, but not quite the whole thing. Okay, so I'm going to show you. Now, I'm just going to put a box around that, and I'm going to call that box 1. When I'm done, I'm going to have a different formula for y. I'm still going to have y by itself, but I'm going to write this in a way that we can type it in on the calculator. So I'm going to write it using either this, this, or that. I'm going to pick one of those three. Okay. So. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take the secant of both sides, okay, just to show you how this works. And the reason I'm going to do that is because I'm going to cancel something out. As long as you take the secant on the left and the right, bless you, you keep it balanced. Does anybody see on the left what would cancel out if I take the secant? What does it look like it would cancel out? Well, oh, then? Not sure? Well, Cassandra? 
you see what, if I do stat on the left, do you see what might cancel out there? Yeah, secant would cancel out with the inverse secant. Right? It's kind of like if you said 3 times 3 divided by 3. Well, if you put a times and a divide right next to each other like that, times 3 divided by 3, it cancels out. If you put a regular secant and an inverse secant right next to each other, it cancels out. And you get that. Okay, my goal, though, was to get y by itself, not x. But that's okay. I'm going to flip each side. And I want, watch what happens if I flip it. Um, right now, I don't have anything in the bottom for that x. So what could I put there so that I can flip it? I can put a 1. So now I can flip it. And does anybody remember what trig function do you get when you flip secant? Which one? Cosecant. Um, not cosecant. It's one of the three basic ones we have buttons for. Um, cosine. If you flip, if you flip the secant, you get the cosine. If you flip the cosine, you get the secant. So all we did here was flip each side. Now, the last step, which I need a little more space. I'm going to get rid of cosine from the right-hand side. How do, you, how do you think I can cancel out cosine? What, what function would be the opposite of cosine that we're learning about today? Inverse cosine. Inverse cosine. So the last thing I'm going to do is take the inverse cosine of what's on each side. Inverse cosine cancels regular cosine. Look what's on the right-hand side again. Why? So after all that work, we still have the exact same thing on the, on the right. But look what we have on the left now. Inverse cosine, not x, 1 over x. And I'm going to call that box 2. Box 1 is equal to y. Box 2 is equal to y. What does that mean about box 1 and 2? Box 1 is equal to y. Box 2 is equal to y. They're equal to each other. Box 1 and box 2 are two ways of doing exactly the same thing. They are equal. So box 1 equals box 2. And that's how you do any of the trig functions we have up above. To do inverse secant, you do the inverse cosine, and you flip it, 1 over x. If you wanted to do the inverse cosecant, when you flip cosecant, which trig function do we get? Sine. So if you want to do inverse cosecant, you need to do inverse sine, but you can't do x. What do you have to do with the x? Flip it, make it 1 over x. And if you want to do inverse cotangent, you don't have a button for inverse cotangent, but what do you get when you flip, uh, Ben, when you flip inverse cotangent, when you flip cotangent, what do you get? We're going to use the tangent, or the inverse tangent, but we can't do x. We're going to flip it, 1 over x. So this does have to do with flipping, but it's not flipping the whole thing. It's just flipping what's right there. Okay, And those are the trickiest ones to type in because you don't have a button for it, so you just have to remember to do that. And these three, you have buttons for all of those. Okay, so let's try one. Try the inverse secant of 1.45. OK, 
Okay, so first thing we got to decide is which trig function am I going to use? Because there's no button for that. So instead of inverse secant, uh, Jamaica? Cosine. Well, we've got to use an inverse one, right? Right. So it's, it's got to be something with a negative one. So inverse cosine, exactly. So we're going to do, instead of inverse secant, we're going to do inverse cosine. But what am I going to do the inverse cosine of? It's not 1.45. It's 1 over 1.45. And now we just type that in. Second, inverse cosine, 1 divided by 1.45. So 46.40. This one, let's just see if we can rewrite it. We don't have to type it in, I just want to know how I would type it in. Brady, can you tell me how I would rewrite that so I could type it in? So you mean like the other one? So yeah, in a way that I could press buttons on the calculator and do it. Inverse sign mm -hmm. times 1 over 2.6. Perfect. Type that in, that's your answer. And we'll finish up with that one. Uh, Abby, how could I rewrite that in a way that I could type it in? The inverse tangent. Uh, 1 over 0.35. Type that in. That's your answer. Okay. So, first thing you want to do, use the chart when you can. If you can't, use a calculator. Okay, so homework um, tonight, it's all in the book. Okay, 187. Um, it's 13 to 17, 19, 20, 22 to 31, and 33. Okay, and that's all. Um, the first part, you can use the chart. Um, the second part, you need a calculator. If you don't have one, now would be a good time to do the 22 to 31 in class, and you can borrow um, one of my calculators.